Welcome back to Division One Rejects. I'm your host, Kobe Manzo. It's episode 171 on the very hot and humid nights, at least up here in Marquette, Michigan, of July 29th. I, I don't like random chances to start this episode. I chose to move up north. We're one lake away from Canada, and I did it for good reason to escape days like this. Uh, it is ridiculous. I felt like I was going to melt every time I stepped outside today. Uh, that is my that is my short piece. I could never do down south, uh, Florida, Georgia, Bama, anything of that nature. Miss me with all the dry heat of Arizona. I don't care. Heat is heat. Um, it, it was brutal today. So I'm glad to be in the studio. A couple fans in here in the basement. Very nice setup. We've got a very nice episode uh, for you tonight. I'm joined here shortly by Charles Gaddy. He's a defensive back who played at the Division I level, transferred down to the D2 level, and is actually making the move from a one MIAA powerhouse to another, going from Northwest Missouri State over to Central Missouri uh, with the Mules. They're putting together quite the roster. We're going to talk about it with him, uh, a.k.a. Baby Chop, here later on. A great story behind that nickname as well um, that you'll definitely want to tune in for. Otherwise, though, on tonight's episode... The East-West Shrine Bowl has released their 1,000, their Shrine Bowl 1,000, if you will, for something very popular. Those of you who follow college football in this landscape know what that is. It's basically their watch list for the bowl game, just kind of giving recognition to players across the country from all levels. And we had about 15 guys from the D2 and Division Three ranks that made that top 1,000 list. So definitely want to do, we posted it on our socials, but definitely wanted to congratulate and, and give those guys their flowers. Otherwise, we've got some new Division Three preseason rankings from D3Football.com that I'm pretty excited to check out. And then some interesting transfer portal stats, once again, from our friends over at Athlink to take a look at. And uh, that'll kind of be it for this episode. Not too much going on, but as always, if you're watching on YouTube, hello. Don't forget the timestamps, video chapters, bottom of the episode right there. Fast forward to any part of the conversation you think sounds remotely interesting. Otherwise, follow us on the socials. I want to say also... Thank you very much for the support on the uh, the Alma content, man. That uh, The facility tour down at Alma College is now our most viewed video on our YouTube channel. It's about to hit like 6,000 views. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. And that was that was something I enjoyed doing so much. I know the people down at Alma were fantastic. They really uh, liked that opportunity. And that's something I do want to do a lot more of. So thank you so much for the support on that. And that's something I want to I want to bring to a lot more campuses this coming off season. We'll see what we can set up and, and what we can get into as far as uh, as far as that goes. But definitely follow us on the socials. Don't forget if you're someone watching this show who uh, y- you know. Coming out of, you know, maybe it's a high school or trying to get some tape in front of college coaches. You're a college guy still trying to find a home, man, right before camp. Man, there are so many things happening. Uh, definitely check out the link in our bio and see how what you can do to get your highlights and your film on the show. We have a couple options available for you guys. But that's enough of that. Let's get right into that conversation with the newest addition to that Central Missouri defensive secondary, Charles Gaddy. Join the show tonight. Former D1 defensive back at Western Carolina. Spent the last couple years in Northwest Missouri. One of the newest additions to a very talented Central Missouri roster. Defensive back Charles Gaddy. What's going on, man? What's up, man? Thanks for having me, man. Excited to get you on here. We've talked a lot about the Mules on this show, dude. Uh, and for good reason. Like the year that they had last year and, and just what they're they're building down there with uh, Coach Lambeau and company. But uh, I'm just excited to get you on here, man. This last couple months for you getting to a new spot has got to be pretty exciting, huh? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm loving it so far, man. I'm loving it here. And your journey is one that has certainly been talked about, at least by Bearcat fans over at Northwest Missouri the last couple of years. But you've overcome a lot to be in this position right now, uh, whether it yeah. is injuries or things off the field or moving and trying to establish yourself in new spots. Let's just start things off with what brought you to, to UCM and what excites you about playing for the Mules. Uh, well, when I entered the portal this last time, it was like a business decision for me, like, I love the time that I spent at Northwest, like met a lot of good guys, like some great coaches over there. But I just had to, you know, I feel like it was my last year and I had to be selfish, but in a good way for myself. You know, like I wanted to do what I thought was best for me and choosing UCM. It, it was it was tough, like at first, like going to another school in the MIAA, but also I felt like it was the best fit for me, like. I came here on an official visit. Like, the coaches were super genuine. Like, they never tried to push on me too much. Like, come here, come here. It was more so just like, hey, this is what, this is how you fit in the program. And, you know, I had to see it for myself. And so far, it's been great adapting to, like, the culture and just getting to know guys here. I love that. And that was something I was going to ask, too, is, like, 
you go from MIAA powerhouse right to another, like just like that. And you're switching sides. You go from the green to the red. Uh, was that something you had even entertained the thought of uh, when you had first entered the transfer portal or not something you saw coming maybe? No, it definitely wasn't something I, something I saw coming at first. I'm not going to lie. Like when I first entered the portal, I wasn't really expecting to stay in the MIAA, but I've been through this recruiting process a few times. So I just know like, when you talk to a coach, like, what's genuine, what's not, like, then when you get there, you get to see and, like, get a feel for things, like, around the community, and that played a big part in it, but, no, I did not expect this at first, no, I didn't. No, fair enough, man, fair enough, and that actually, you know, kind of piggybacks right into my next question, is that when you've gone through, someone in your shoes has gone through the process a couple of times of trying to find a new home like that, do you feel that... <laughs> You maybe you're more well equipped, whether that is mentally or just how to handle or how to, like you said, determine maybe some of the genuine and separate some of the the real from the fake for for lack of a better term. Uh, when you're looking at some of these schools and talking to other coaches, do you feel like this time around maybe you're better prepared than fresh out of high school? Oh yeah, for sure. Because you know, fresh out of high school, like you're young, you don't really know like what's really genuine or not. It yeah. ain't like a high school coach. Like it's a once you get to college, it's a business. But also sometimes like. You got those coaches who is more than the business too. Like they actually care about the kids that's on their team. Like yep. they ain't there for the money. So, I mean, everybody different. Like you got to respect it either way because it is a business, but it's also some coaches out there where it ain't just about the business. It's also also about the players. Hell yeah. And from a coach's perspective, perspective too, you're not going to recruit a guy, a four- or five-year guy that you get into a program. You're not going to recruit him the same as a guy in your shoes that has one year and you're coming to fulfill a job and fill a spot right now, right? Not to say that there's more emphasis on one or the other because they both serve very specific and very necessary roles on those teams. But how do you think maybe from a coach's perspective that differs in your experience, uh, maybe how those conversations change or maybe even the timeline changes? Oh, really? I just, when it comes to, like, the recruiting process and everything, like, you really got to just soak it all up. Like, even if you were a freshman, uh, a transfer, whatever, like, you, it's really just all about what you think the best fit is for you. You know what I'm saying? And, like, there's going to be coaches that hit you up and you would think, you would think they love you and then you won't hear from them after that day. Like, that's just how the portal goes. So it's just really about, like, who really, who really want you, who really, like, want you to be a part of their program and what coaches you connect with throughout that process. You just got to take it all in, though, and just, you know, figure out what the best decision is for you to make. Yeah, absolutely, man. That that stays the same through through all of it, and your kind of your mindset and approach should, emphasis on should, be the same. For a lot of guys, and a lot of times it is not, and I think that's where you get into some of the problems uh, with the portal and with guys that – um, you know, can't find those those landing spots. But for you, football has brought you to a few different places. Obviously, that started back in high school. Your first real move, going down to Georgia, man, where you said uh, started to take playing football in college a bit more serious down there. Talk to me about uh, those last couple of years of of high school football for you, and and maybe how it changed the way you viewed the game. Oh uh, well, my junior year of high school, like going into my okay, yeah, going into my junior year of high school um, at Douglas County High School in Douglasville, Georgia, we got a new coaching staff. Um, we got a few coaches from a little bit everywhere, but they had great coaching experience, like coach in Georgia football. We had a head coach who won state championships. Um, okay. His name is John T. White. And uh, he really came and he changed my whole perspective on high school football. Like before he came to Douglas County, like I'm going to be honest, like we didn't know what it looked like to get offers. Like we never knew how the process went. Like we knew nothing about coaches showing up to high schools, none of that stuff. Like, yeah. We was just kids that was just happy to be playing the sport. And when he got there, like, I want to say it was maybe his first day on the job. Like, we were seeing Alabama, Clemson, like, Georgia, like, all these schools walking through our building. And we was like, bro, like, no way this is real. So I just knew, like, from that, that day forward, like, I just knew how serious it was and, like, what it took to get to that level. And my coach instilled that in us early, like, as far as they're on the job, like, if you really want to do this college thing, like, it's starting now. Like, let's get this rolling. So I say my last few years of high school was just, like, a great learning experience for me because it actually brought me closer to the game and got me where I am today. That's big time. 
That's big time. And not everyone gets that, right? And it took you maybe a, a change in scenery, a new coach, or, or something along those lines, maybe something else that kind of uh, put that into your the forefront of your mind, which is which is cool. And I'm glad that you got to experience that. Now, coming out of high school then, you get a good amount of interest, end up at Western Carolina, and it's not as if you didn't see the field, right? You get a good amount of snaps out there, even start a handful of games. But you talked about needing a fresh start after after getting your degree and graduating. What initially spurred that thought uh, after graduation, knowing you wanted to go to a different spot? And and was a D2 school like Northwest even a possibility uh, on your radar after that? Uh, yeah, it was. How I felt at that moment, it was just like, I feel like I just needed a fresh start. Like, I had been there. I graduated. I had two years of eligibility left. And I was just yep. like, I got two years left and already got my degree. Why not grad transfer and just start somewhere new? So going into it, like, I'm going to be honest, I ain't care if it was another FCS, it was FBS, Powerhouse D2. But a funny story is I kind of used to kind of used to see Northwest play. I think it was the time in, like, 2015 or 2016, one of the championship years. Yeah. I saw them on ESPN. They had did, like, a trick play on a pick six. Like, they called a pick. And they kept, like, tossing it back to each other. So that was, like, the only time I heard of that school. And <laughs> when they reached out to me, I was like, dang, like, this is a school I seen on ESPN when I was younger. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So that was a cool moment. And uh, I, obviously, like, Northwest Missouri State, they got great history. Like, yeah. great guys that came out of there. So I just took the time to get to know the coaches. I came up on a visit, and I felt like that was the best fit for me and a good fresh start for me. And you knew, obviously, some of that history getting into it. It's not like you just showed up on, on campus on day one and just said, you know, oh, surprised by everything. Like, you do your homework, right? Coming into a building, you're trying to do your research and, and know some of the faces and, and know kind of what, you know, get, get a sense of the operation before you just show up and become a part of it. What were your expectations knowing some of those things? Um, I, I think a lot of people on the outside, of when you see that, that level of success, I think a lot of people assume that uh, a program like that is run incredibly tight and incredibly disciplined. And were those kind of the things that you saw right away? What were those expectations like? And uh, what was your reaction when you got on campus? Oh, yeah, for sure. Once I saw the team, like I knew, I kind of saw what got them, what they had. You know what yep. I'm saying? Like, very tight knit, good family culture, like everybody was close. So that was something I looked at that really caught my eye. But I would say like it's time to start fresh. Like just put your head down and grind and like show them what you can do is how it was really my approach when I got to Northwest that first year. Yeah, man. And and that's really all you want to do when you go to a new spot is come in and prove yourself all, all over again, right? In front of a new group of guys, a new set of coaches, and uh, even a new fan base, right? At this level, when you have a very passionate fan base like Northwest that is obviously all 100% behind that football program. But you fast forward to next year, you finally get that chance with a new squad. Terry Meniscus, game one, sidelines you for the year. Just all of that gone in an instant. Like I told you before, I can certainly appreciate and understand that, but talk to me about that process, what you learned uh, about yourself during that, and I guess also about that squad and that team, that community. Oh, man. Uh, just back to that day, man. I still I still think about that day. I think that was going to be one of the best football games I ever played, and, like, the fan base really, like, embraced me, you know what I'm saying? Like, even after. saw like how genuine everybody was in Maryville like around that time like I had a lot of people loving on me like when I had surgery and everything like teammates showing up bringing me food and stuff that's awesome about well, learned a lot about the team at that point we became a lot close I became a lot closer with a lot of guys throughout that process uh for me personally uh, it was a mental struggle because I had never had a serious injury or had to get surgery. So I had a lot of like doubts in my mind when I first. A lot of people around me that was motivating me, whether that was my family, my girlfriend, or like just friends, period. Like I just had a lot of people that yep. lifted me up throughout that process you need that. and helped me get back on my feet. 100%, man. And you need that. And then now you've obviously come out on the other side of that, right? You go on to have a, a successful year following that, make a big impact in that defensive secondary in 2023. Now, on to your final year, UCM. What goes through your mind when you think about, you know, what you want to accomplish this last year, one last go around? Oh, man, I'm trying to win it all. I'm trying to go out with a bang. 
And I'm gonna be honest, I feel real good about it. Like I ain't gonna spoil it too much, but we definitely gonna put the world like on notice. They about to see like what we really could do. Like this, this, this the year. And for me personally, man, I set I set goals pretty high for myself because last year I feel like it was just a confidence builder for me, like coming back off the injury. But this year, like I got that swag back, so uh, Hell yeah. I'm ready to get out there and show what I really could do. I love that, dude. You're not the only guy, you know, on that roster that thinks that way. We know that. Uh, speaking of another dude that's got that same mindset, you pumped to practice against the Harlan Hill winner or what? Yeah, man. That, that's my dog, though. That's my yep. dog. Yeah, we, yeah. We definitely going to compete for sure. I was going to say, I, yeah. Oh, he can make me better. I definitely know he can make me better. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that offense is one that, that we've talked about, again, rightfully so, a lot on, on this particular show. But uh, maybe haven't given the defense as much love as, as we should have in the past because they were also a reason that they're in a lot of those games. But uh, feels like that squad has potential to be very balanced. And I know you haven't been able to uh, really see it yet. Camp is pretty quick approaching. When do you guys start, by the way? Uh, August 7th. August 7th is like Port Day, and I think we officially Dude, it's close. Yeah. It's close. Is yeah. real close, and you're gonna have a, a a fun group of guys down there, a really competitive group of guys. That's kind of the general sense that I get. Um, but you're one of quite a few of them coming to Central Missouri that have a lot of the D1 experience, and I think that's something that's worth noting. Uh, what do you make of that, and what kind of emphasis has their coaching staff put on bringing the, in that kind of caliber of player? Um, I think this coaching staff is really smart. I think they know what we want to do as a group, and I think. Maybe they just had some pieces that they had to put back together. I know they lost some big keys last year. They had some really good players last year that left. So I think they just replacing that, and we're going to build off that. But um, I think these guys that we bringing in, like everybody getting along really fast, like we trying to build something like special here. So I think the coaches did a great job for bringing those pieces in. And they don't really emphasize or try to bring anybody else down. Like obviously – it's a process like a kid going to come here to play, but it's also a kid's job that's been here to keep his job. So, yep. you know, it just creates competition and, you know, trying to build greatness. Yeah, man. That's kind of ask going to ask too. Like when you have these conversations, especially a guy in your spot, not that uh, a lot of teams would necessarily like promise you a job off the rip, but um, because that, again, that would be a discredit to some of the guys they have in their roster now. But what are those conversations like uh, with them being very open about like, hey, you're going to come here and have a great chance to play, obviously, and come in and, and earn a lot of really big time snaps. But again, it goes back to earn that word earn of like coming into camp and earning those snaps over guys that have potentially been here for two, three, four years. What were those conversations like with the staff? Oh, it wasn't no no promises or anything. You yeah. know, like that we run a we run a defense here that I think. I could, I could see myself in and fit in perfectly. You know what I'm saying? And that's kind of the conversation we had. Like, I would ask questions. They would ask me questions, what I like, and then they would tell me how they feel about me. And it's just about all about how I see myself in this defense and how they see me. So, there's no promises. Definitely got to come out and prove myself still, no matter what I did in the past. I think that goes oh, for yeah. anybody. You know what I'm saying? So, I still got to come out and prove myself. But I won't really have conversations about, roster spots and things like that. Like, it's definitely some movement on the rosters and things like that for guys to get a chance to prove they self. So that's really all it is, is when you get your shot, just, you know, take advantage of it. You take care of what you can take care of, and the rest will shit. It'll figure itself out. I think that's the way to go, man. That's the right mindset. It's kind of funny, too. Like, it's not like an apples-to-apples -apples comparison by any means, but I think in terms of, uh, you know, in the NFL where where teams feel like they kind of have a window, right, to really get something happen. Maybe you've got a, a franchise quarterback. Sound familiar? At least uh, the equation of which you guys have over there at uh, Central Missouri right now. And I almost think from the perspective of, like, yeah, obviously you want to get freshmen in here and develop them and, like, turn this into a program that continually has these kind of seasons. But also the other half of me, again, I'm not a coach over there. I have no idea how they think. But just the, the other person to me is like, man, we got a dude here under center right now. We got some other really talented dudes around him. Let's find as many talented guys that have a ton of game experience. And, like, this is our window. Like, this year is a year where we can go out and win the whole damn thing like you talked about earlier. I'd imagine that is uh, kind of an unspoken sense around there. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, we know. We know. Like, we we as a group know, the coaches know. Like, we know what we got, and we know what it's going to take to get where we want to be. Like, it ain't something we got to really keep broadcasting or, you know yeah. what I'm saying, putting on social yeah. media. You just like let that. me like, talk about it. 
Yeah, we really yep. tighten it, but we definitely yeah. know what we got. We definitely know what we got for sure. That's good, man. Where does uh where does baby chop come from? Ah, uh, so um when I was six years old, my dad he passed away and uh he went by Chop. His nickname was Chop. Oh, and I'm not man. old as son, but like everybody always just told me, like, man, you remind me so much of your dad. You remind me so much of your dad. That's and awesome. um I'd, uh, I think he got what? six seven kids and i'm the only one that got his last name still like you know what i'm saying and i don't got that many memories with my dad but i was just like you know what i'm saying he always lived through me so i just took his name and I, and now i'm chopped so so that way he always living through me somehow you know what i mean that's incredible brother cut the baby off is just chopped that's awesome man yeah. dang that is that's that's a, a lot better of a of a background you know story and I guess origin story of that name that I was expecting. I'm glad that you're uh, that you're carrying that on, man. I know that uh, that's just something that, that a lot of people w- would kill for. So I'm excited for you and uh, uh, excited to watch you guys compete this season, man. Appreciate you. Oh, for <laughs> sure. Man. Yeah, absolutely, man. Have a good rest of your night. Definitely be following up with you along the season, my man. You too, man. Thank you for having me tonight, man. I really appreciate you. Of course. See you, man. All right, my guy. Thank you very much to the man, Charles himself, joining me here tonight. Uh, a Detroit native, too, by the way. I don't know if I mentioned that during the conversation. And then moving down to Georgia, if you're from, you know, lower Michigan, you understand that, like, that Detroit metro Detroit area, got some good football down there. Yes, I'm biased. I grew up right around there. But there's some really, really good football there. You go down to Georgia, that speaks for itself, right? They don't really have to vouch for, uh, for that area too much. The dude's been around a lot of great football. I'm excited to see what him and uh, the Mules do this year. But let's talk about the Shrine Bowl 1000, the East-West Shrine Bowl, uh, one of the postseason bowl games for a lot of guys who are draft eligible to go and try and uh, raise their stock, if you will, college guys who are out of eligibility to go and do that. Now, they released their Shrine Bowl 1000, which in a sense is their watch list for the bowl. And it doesn't necessarily mean that only these 1,000 guys will end up making the bowl game. What it does mean is that uh, these guys are on their list for good reason. And there were uh, quite a few Division two and Division three players that made this year's wrist list, excuse me, 15 of them to be exact. I want to go through this list and uh, just recognize these guys on this particular program because that in itself, I feel, is a pretty cool accomplishment. You've seen a lot of that on Twitter and Instagram in the last couple of days. Start things off at the bottom middle there. The man, Tanner Volk, who uh, was very close to breaking an NCAA record for interceptions last year. Just absolutely incredible football player, potentially even better human. He's doing bone marrow transplants and donating uh, in that way off the field and making a difference. But the dude is his play on the field speaks for itself. How about Zach Zabrowski, the reigning Harlan Hill winner in the middle right there, the quarterback for the Mules we talked about earlier on. And then uh, his newest teammate as well, Cardell Thomas, offensive lineman at UCM. He's not in the Central Missouri jersey on this graph. You see him kind of the top middle right there. He's in a FAMU, Florida A&M. He actually spent three to four years at LSU before moving to Florida A&M, and now I believe is finishing up his college eligibility and his career at Central Missouri. So the Mules are bringing on a lot of that top-level former Division I talent. I'm very, very curious to to speak with Coach Lamberson and them down there about, uh, you know, all these additions they have coming in because, man, they are going to be putting together a really potent roster. Now, continuing to go down the list, a couple of names maybe I haven't heard uh, as much of Kofi, uh, Kofi, sorry, Kofi Gebekel. He is uh, from Concordia St. Paul. And uh, from the defensive side of things, you see him down there in the middle left, a guy that you'll notice here as we go through the list, the NSIC is perhaps the best conference represented out of any of the smaller school conferences. You've got him from Concordia St. Paul, a pair from Mankato, a pair from Duluth, and then even one from Northern State as we go on. So let's talk about those guys. Marshall Fulmer and Maven Kretschy, those those two from Mankato getting things done for the Mavericks are opposed to have yet another really good year. And then also to Aiden Williams and Sam Pitts, offensive line and tight end, I believe, respectively, over at Minnesota Duluth, a top 25 ranked team, both them and Mankato in that regard. So the NSIC, man, we've talked about it a lot. There's a lot of depth in that conference. Those guys, just the tip of the iceberg of how many uh, great, talented players are in that conference. How about Andre Jefferson, the defensive lineman from Lenore Ryan, who has made quite the name for himself the last couple of years. His last season over there for the Bears is going to be one to remember. You see him there on the bottom left. He's one that, that we've known about for quite a while. Moving down, though. 
Maybe another unfamiliar name, and DeAndre Campbell over at uh, Deontay Campbell, excuse me, over at uh, Missouri Southern here in the top left. Not a name that maybe we've heard too often. So excited to see him getting recognized. Definitely have to tap in with his season this year. With I would believe that would be you no, know, the Griffins are Western. That'd be the Lions, Missouri Southern. Luke Lanin, one of the only two only Division three players on this list. The quarterback from uh, defend, not shouldn't say defending, but runner up. In North Central, they won it the year prior. That dude knows how to win, and I no shock that he's on this list. Uh, going down the, the list, continuing, though, Luke Gunderson from one Luke to another, the linebacker from Northern State, another uh, NSIC shout-out there. The only representative from the GLIAC Conference, and Micah Kretzinger, the linebacker out of Saginaw Valley State. And then you go down to Melvin Smith from Southern Arkansas and Parker Rochford from Wart- Wartburg, excuse me, the last uh, Division Three player there. So that's your list from the Shrine 1000. We'll be excited to kind of see uh, with these guys, you know, making this list, it's a great, a great accomplishment. It is a great achievement, and I love that we can recognize these guys in the grand scheme of things. They all know this, too. It doesn't mean jack. It does not mean jack all. So now, if anything, it's more motivation for them that, hey, these guys, whoever is doing these evaluations, whoever is you know taking a look at all these different players, they saw something in me that separates me from the rest of the pack um, that maybe makes me an intriguing prospect. For So for those guys in that list, that have professional aspirations. Uh, I think this is just uh, kind of a neat thing. Well, that, again, again, I go back to it doesn't mean anything, and they know that. So uh, a lot of proof it seasons coming up for those guys to secure that uh, that name that they've earned. Now, let's move over to uh, some more Division Three rankings. I think I'm just going to throw them up on the screen for you guys. I will not read through the entire list. I'll probably give you the top 10, and then uh, if you want to see the rest, you can always go up to our YouTube and check those out. I know this isn't like too big. It's not a great graphic or anything, but you guys can at least read and see right there. So number one ranked in the D three football.com preseason rankings for division three football, North central Cortland comes in at number two. There are 14 first place votes for North central and 11 for Cortland. Now, you know, maybe not too surprising. I think a lot of that weighs into what Cortland is losing, but I know talking with Cole Burgess last time we had him on here, there's a lot coming back for the Red Dragons. So uh, a little surprised the defending national champion is not number one, but like I said, those two can go back and forth. I think either of them have certainly warranted a top spot when it comes to uh, at least the preseason rankings based off of last year. Now going through the rest of the list, from third on down, UW-Whitewater, Wartburg, Mount Union, Lacrosse, Alma, Johns Hopkins, you got Wheaton, Randolph-Macon, Grove City, you know, you start to get down into that list. A lot of teams that we're very, very familiar with. And uh, the biggest thing here compared to probably the Lindsay, Lindy's uh, preseason sports magazine, Alma coming in at, uh, that would be 7th right there, as compared to like a 15th or 16th for Lindy's, which was absurd. Uh, this Alma team is definitely getting the recognition that it deserves now. Whitewater, Lacrosse, two of the powerhouses over there on the YAC. You have uh, also down on the list River Falls getting some recognition at 17th. I believe those are potentially... The only three, yes, they are the only three YAC squads, which again, only three. That sounds crazy, but we're used to seeing potentially even more YAC squads uh, in top 25. That's not to say, again, this could change so much between now uh, and even the start of September, October, that kind of thing. So there, don't put too much weight in this. But um, Whitewater certainly uh, has a lot of praise coming off an uncharacteristic two-loss season for the Warhawks over there. Wartburg has shown us exactly what they're about. Mount Union, Lacrosse, those teams we know are going to rebuild. Lacrosse does lose quite a big a few big pieces especially offensively but uh addressing the transfer portal and some other things they look to rebuild how about uh johns hopkins wheaton is kind of an intriguing one being as high as there but you look at their record and, and i think it you know it kind of speaks for itself uh randolph macon is one that doesn't surprise me at all grove city had quite the historic run last year. D3Football.com certainly seems to believe that that will be a, a repeat ordeal uh, down there in, I believe, Pennsylvania for Grove City. So exciting stuff to look at. Once again, don't put too much weight in it. It's it's not anything uh, too official, but I'll be very curious to see uh, which one of these teams uh, comes out on top. But also kind of how these how these shake out. We have you know we've seen more parity in the uh, non conference out of conference scheduling in Division Three football the last five years than than I can remember, and I haven't been covering it for that long, admittedly. But it seems to me with the current playoff system that these teams are starting to understand that mate, hey, hey, we need to go out and schedule these really tough out-of-conference games to prove that we belong in one of those at-large bids because you're getting, it, you say you're UW Lacrosse, UW Whitewater, for instance, and you don't win the WIAC, which is, you know, again, there's a really tough conference to win in itself. 
but you still have like 10, 11 wins. And now you're like not a shoe in for the playoffs. So there's a lot of teams that think I figured that out that you need to schedule these hard out of conference games. It just makes for more exciting football for us, the viewers, the first couple weeks of the season um, or whenever they do sprinkle in those non conference games. So I am excited about it for one. I'm ready for D3 football to start. I'm ready for all football to start this fall. But let's close out the episode. On this note from our friends over at Athlink, the 2024 Division 2 II and 3 transfer portal statistics. Now, taking a look at this, you can see oh, it's kind of cut off on your guys' screen there, but 4,000 plus, I believe that says 4,000. Hold on, I'm going to make sure. Yeah, 4,000 plus entries. Division 2 II and Division 3. From September 2023 to August of 2024, there were 4,000 plus entries into the transfer portal, which is absurd. 70% of those were from Division II, 30% from Division Three, or uh, yeah, I should say from Division Three. Now, I think this is where we should start, is that, you know, what was their experience level? Right. And uh, you look, you see there and it makes the most sense. The highest percentage of guys are the guys uh, that did not play on these teams that are obviously looking for other opportunities, whether it was, uh, you know, the coaching staff maybe didn't see them in the right fit. They had different ideas what they wanted to do that uh, 40 some percent there. You had 25 percent that played meaningful snaps. And then you also had uh, almost 20 percent that started. One and a half, I believe, percent, it says, of all Americans. And then 7% of all conference selections actually entered the transfer portal. And now, obviously, a lot of those guys, let's talk the destination. Those are the guys that are moving up a level, right? So, from the D2 and D3 transfer portal, you had 3% of those 4,000 entries that made it to the FBS level, right? So, we're talking, like, the biggest level of football. And I am not good enough at math. I guess 3% of... One th- hold on, we're just going to go straight calculator on this, guys. 4,000. 0.03. According to these statistics, if 3% of all these guys, or of these, uh, you know, Division two guys, oh, wait, hold on, I got to do another piece of math here. 40,000 times 0. 0.7, that's 70%, right? We're of Division two, so that's 2,800 players times 0. 0.03, 84. So, according to this number right here, 3% of those Division II transfers went to the FBS. That's 84 guys from Division II squads that transferred up to FBS. Now, does this guarantee that they are on scholarship? Absolutely not. It's just saying that the guy, these guys believe that they had what it takes to not only go up a level to Division I, but go to FBS level at the highest level. We also had 6% of them go to the FCS level, and then uh, quite a bit... Going to Division Two, obviously making that kind of lateral move. Some to Division Three. That non right there, I'm assuming, accounts for NAIA, and then uh, the UNC. I would assume that is the number that is uh, uncommitted. That's scary. You see that on the bottom there. Seventy percent. Seventy percent of Division Two transfer portal athletes uncommitted, and then if you look down. At this, uh, let's see here. I might have to open this up in a new, in a new deal. I apologize. There we go. You guys can probably see that a little bit better, but I'm going to try and zoom in for you here and get like, yeah, here we go. Here we go. Now we're talking. Now we're talking. Okay. 70% of those division two players uncommitted. You see there in the bottom, right? 81% of the transfers entries from division three still uncommitted as of August, 2024. Holy shit. Now, from those Division Three guys, looks like only 2% went FBS, uh, 3% to FCS, 5% to D2, 6% to D3, and 81% uncommitted. That's incredible. I mean, that, that right there is incredible. So we can do the math right now, actually. You know what I mean? So let's go 70% of that 4,000. So there are 2,800 Division Two transfer portal entries. You do 70% of that, that's 1,960 uncommitted players from Division II that entered the transfer portal. 1,960. And if you do the same math, you get 972 players from Division III that entered the portal and did not find a home. You add that together. Hello, calculator. Out of 4,000 student athletes from Division Two and Division Three that entered the transfer portal, 2,932 athletes still remain uncommitted. Wake up, people. 
This is ridiculous. That number is astounding, and I don't even know what to make of it anymore. Now, with that being said, there's still some other great opportunities being had for the people on here that are going to uh, you know, go on to bigger and better or even make that lateral move. Oh, shit, even make that move down from a D2 to a D3 or other, you know, vice versa, whatever's going on. They're going to earn new opportunities for themselves, and I'm all here for it. But just some really interesting stats to break down here. The largest percent of the transfer portal by position Looks like was defensive back at over 20%. Next up, the wide receiver room. And then offensive line, it looks like. Which is potentially a kind of a shocker. Now, looking at that, though, I think what, what does make sense... Oh, no, defensive line. Sorry, the O and the D look very similar. What does make a lot of sense, though, when you look at a wide receiver, a DB, or a defensive lineman, offensive lineman, those, those kind of groups that have the largest percentages, linebacker is right there, too. How many of them are on the field at one time? Depending on the package, you might have four wide receivers in the field. You might have four or five and a nickel uh, kind of defensive back type players in the field at a time. Linebacker could have three, maybe four uh, on the field at a time. Defensive line, offensive line, you know the deal. The categories that are seeing a lot lower of a percentage at quarterback, running back, tight end, special teams, those kind of things, long snapper even 1% over there. Those are kind of situations where you typically only have one or maybe two on the field at a time, especially when you're talking about quarterbacks. So it doesn't make it doesn't really surprise me that there's not a ton uh, of quarterbacks coming in the portal. Just there's not as many of them. You only have so many. So I think uh, it's not to give a bad rap to DBs and wide receivers. There's literally just physically more of them on the field at once, and then therefore there are more players that play those positions. So I, I was very intrigued by this entire data set right here from Athlink. Shout out to them for putting this together because uh, some of these numbers are astounding and they definitely do their due diligence. Uh, this is not just some random thrown together list of all kinds of numbers. They really go through and do this. Now, the eligibility wise, you see, is actually really clearly split. Really clearly split. You look at four years, so the, the 26% of those transfer for four years of eligibility left, which is, that's wild, by the way, dude. Four years left and you're already out. 24% still had three years. Looks like 25 had two years, and then another 25 had one year. And uh, looking at this little number, you guys might not be able to read. I'll pull it up a little bit closer right here. 21% were grad transfers, which, again, that makes a lot of sense. Guys who get a degree. We just talked to Gaddy, Charles Gaddy, earlier on, um, talking about how he was a graduate transfer from Western Carolina, making that move to Northwest Missouri State. So, I mean... Let me know what you guys think of this. I, I'm very curious to hear your thoughts uh, on some of these numbers. And I think, you know, this first full cycle of the transfer portal. Yes, I understand the transfer portal has been here for more than one cycle. But, like, this feels like the first with, like, COVID and, and all the other red shirts and all the extra eligibility. We're finally through that. This I shouldn't say first. This final cycle of the big transfer portal movement. I think we're going to start to see a lot more stabilization. I have no idea, though. I'm not a... I just kind of talk about football, so I have no idea. I, in my opinion, though, I think we see some stabilization after this. One, because you're weeding out over 2,000, almost 3,000 kids from the transfer portal that are just not going to play football anymore, supposing those uncommitted guys do not go and find new homes. It's going to be hard for them to find at this stage of the game. That's a big part of it, right? You're getting a lot of kids who maybe just aren't, you know, they're done playing football. They're not coming back. They're not going to play football again, uh, competitive football at the college level in their lifetime, which is a scary thought. But also because, you know, we kind of understand how this works now. And kids maybe hopefully, hopefully are looking at these numbers like I am and understanding that there's a very good chance that uh, that might be the case for them. So we'll see if it stabilizes. Appreciate Athlink for all this great information. And uh, that'll wrap it up for today's episode. For D1 Rejects, I'm Kobe Manzo. Thank you very much for tuning in.